Hello Commanders, this is Commander Orodruin, a retired mentor of the anti xeno initiative and today we will be taking a look at one of the most popular builds for anti xeno combat or AX for short, the Meta Chieftain, and some of its variants. I will lay out the design of the Meta Chieftain in ED Chipyard while explaining the choices made and discussing a couple of details along the way. The Meta Chieftain is a highly capable and versatile AX ship, suitable for beginners and veterans alike and can take on anything from single cyclopes to multiple hydros at a time. The Meta Chieftain is a shieldless cold orbiting ship. For tutorials on how to make the best of it, you can have a look at some of the videos linked in the description. Also note that the Meta Chieftain is heavily engineered. Towards the end of the video, I will discuss where you can save a bit of engineering materials if you do not wish to make the full investment straight away. However, if you do decide to stay in AX, getting your ship fully engineered will mean a lot for your ship's capabilities. But let us now begin by selecting the Alliance Chieftain, which by default comes with a lot of garbage in it, that we start by removing. The core modules cannot be removed, so let us start by looking at those in the order they are listed. First of all, we look at the armor of the ship. As the damage you will be facing in AX is caustic and absolute, the resistances offered by the different types of armor are irrelevant. Instead, we want to go for as many raw hull points as possible, and this is offered by the military-grade composites with heavy-duty engineering and the deep plating experimental effect. The mirrored and reactive surface composites offer the same amount of hull, but are more expensive and therefore do nothing in AX, except increase your rebuy. Moving on to the power plant, AX ships in general are quite power-hungry, and we will need the strongest power plant we can fit. In the case of the Chieftain, this is a 6A power plant. Since we are building a cold orbiting ship, we engineer the power plant with the armored effect. This increases the power plant's integrity, power capacity and heat efficiency, all in one, at the cost of a bit of extra mass. The overcharged effect should be avoided if you can power your ship without it, as it gives a power plant with significantly worse thermal efficiency. For the experimental effect, we pick thermal spread for an even better thermal efficiency. An alternative here, if you do not have enough power in your build, is the monster experimental, which increases the power generated. However, the Meta Chieftain does not require more power than what is provided by the armored 6A power plant with thermal spread. The thrusters are the most important module for a cold orbiting AX ship. The thrusters let us maintain the orbit around the interceptor, as well as building distance for repairs and flacking the tartan swarm down when required. We therefore equip the best possible thrusters we can obtain for the Chieftain. 6A thrusters, engineered with dirty drive engineering and the drag drives experimental. No other option comes close to this, so there really isn't much to discuss here. When it comes to the frameshift drive, it is not at all important to AX as long as you are able to arrive where you wish to fight. You can therefore really fit whatever you want here, but having a bit of jump range for traveling around the Pleiades is always nice. The weight of the FSD is also not very detrimental to the flight profile of the Chieftain, so many will go with the best you can fit here as well, which is the pre-engineered 5A frameshift drive. If you do not have access to that, you can fit a regular 5A FSD, engineered with increased range and mass manager. Or you can fit whatever FSD you wish, it will not matter much for the fight itself. For the ship's life support, we go for the lightest one available to save a bit of weight. The D-rated life support supplies 7.5 minutes of oxygen in an emergency, which should be more than enough to arrive at and dock at a station if necessary. In order to save even more weight, we engineer the life support with a lightweight effect. An alternative here is using an A-rated life support for additional oxygen, if you wish to stay and fight after your canopy is breached. But this is mainly up to individual preference. After your thrusters, the most important module on your ship is the power distributor. This is responsible for routing and distributing power to your systems, engines and weapons, and determines how fast you can charge the corresponding capacitors. As Gauss cannons, the AX weapon of choice, are extremely power hungry, your power distributor often puts an upper limit on how much damage you can deal. With a power distributor that recharges too slowly, your weapons will quickly run out of power and you will also overheat due to the heat generated by them. In the Meta Chieftain, with a single heatsink active, the distributor 
and not the gauze cannons themselves will limit the sustained fire rate. You will also need to ensure that your system's capacitor has sufficient charge to run your heat sinks and the power stored in the engine capacitor comes in very handy whenever you need to boost. We therefore also need the best power distributor we can find, with the highest recharge rate. For the Chieftain, this is a 6A power distributor with charged enhanced engineering and superconduits experimental effect, which both increase the recharge rate of all three capacitors. As a suboptimal alternative, we could instead choose weapon focused engineering. This will result in a larger weapons capacitor with a little less weapons regeneration, but also result in significantly worse capacity and regeneration for systems and engines. The result is a ship that has lower heat spikes but loses out on boost capacity and marginally on damage done. For the sensors, just like for the life support, we choose to derate them in order to save a bit of weight and power. We also engineer the sensors for long range to keep the interceptors on our scanner even at distance. This is particularly useful when learning AX combat. Lightweight is however also a viable alternative. As there are not many options for the fuel tank, it is the only module we leave as it came in the stock chieftain. Moving on to the hard points, the bread and butter weapons of AX combat are the Guardian Gauss cannons, which come in two sizes, medium and small. They can be unlocked and bought at the Guardian Tech Broker, and the link to Exigius' excellent video on how to unlock them is included in the description. If you are serious about going into AX, you will need to unlock both sizes and you may as well unlock the Guardian module reinforcement packs while you are anyway traveling to Guardian space. It should be noted that, as of the release of this video, Guardian modules have been rendered inoperable in HIP22460 due to the Proteus wave malfunction. However, there are many other places where you can do AX combat, so I will not be covering builds for this particular system. In the Meta Chieftain, we use two medium gauss cannons in the large hardpoints on the top of the ship and two small ones in the small hardpoints right next to them. Note that while it would be possible to equip a total of three medium and one small gauss cannons, this would not increase the Chieftain's sustained damage output, as the distributor limits our sustained rate of fire even with the current loadout. In addition, the convergence of the medium hardpoint with the rest is less than optimal. Instead, we use the medium hardpoint, which is located below the ship, to equip a remote release flak launcher, which will be used to deal with the Targon Swarm. Do note that this hardpoint also has an unfortunate placement relative to the cargo hatch. As a result, flak will sometimes bounce off any repair limpet that is attached and repairing. This may be avoided by not using the flak launcher while repairing, or you could simply accept the loss of a few flak rounds. Make sure that you buy the flak launcher and not the remote release flechette launcher. More than one recruit has arrived to the fight equipped with the wrong weapons. Finally, in the remaining small hardpoints, just above the cockpit, we place a small beam laser, engineered with a long range and thermal vent experimental effect. The main purpose of this laser is to cool down your ship while inserting yourself into cold orbit with the secondary function of being able to chip away at the interceptor's shield. Because of this, the thermal vent effect is absolutely necessary. You may choose between the fixed and gimbaled beams. The gimbaled beam has the advantage of dissipating heat marginally faster and being somewhat easier to keep on target, while the fixed beam does higher shield damage. The turreted beam is not optimal, as its heat dissipation is significantly worse than the fixed and gimbaled versions. Also note that you should not fire the beam laser during attack runs, as it has the effect of depleting your power distributor faster and therefore has the somewhat counterintuitive effect of making you run hotter, rather than cooling you down, as well as limiting your rate of fire even further. Instead, what you will rely on to keep you cold during attack runs are heatsink launchers, which go into all of the utility slots. Ideally, they should all be engineered to hold an extra heatsink. You will use a lot of them, so any extras count, and you will also get an additional sink when synthesizing more. Finally, we arrive at the optional internals. Since we are in a shieldless ship, the internals will be focused on protecting and repairing your hull and modules. We therefore start off by ensuring a healthy level of module protection 
by installing one large and two smaller module reinforcement packs, or MRPs. The Guardian versions of the MRPs are strictly better than the human ones in terms of health while offering the same protection level at the cost of a little bit of power. Since the Chieftain can sustain this power usage, we use Guardian MRPs. We install a large size 5 and then the two smallest we can fit, a size 1 and a size 2, for a total module protection level of 94%. The reason for this setup is that the larger MRPs will take damage first and having a size 5 will therefore offer the full protection level for as long as it is not rendered inoperable. Should the large MRP be broken, the module protection level will drop to 84% and at that point it will anyway be time to withdraw to consider your options, so the integrity of the two additional MRPs is not of as much relevance as the first, meaning that we can fit the small ones without compromising the build. Note that you should not put any MRPs into the military slots, as those are last in the damage priority list. For example, installing a size 4 MRP in a military slot together with a size 2 and a size 1 in the smaller normal slots would lead to the size 2 taking damage first. As it has significantly lower integrity, it breaks much faster and leaves you with a lower module protection. Once our module protection is in place, we start thinking about repairs. There are two things we will need to repair, our hull and our modules. For the modules, we install an auto field maintenance unit. A 2A1 still has plenty of repair capacity for our purposes and is therefore perfectly fine. In the worst case, if you take heavy module damage, it can be refilled relatively cheaply through synthesis. For the hull repairs, we install the largest repair limpet controller that we can fit, a size 5. We choose to derate it because of the lower weight and power draw. All of the repair limpet controllers of the same size have the same repair capacity and only differ in active range, which is irrelevant, as we will be repairing ourselves. In order to get any use out of the repair limpet controller, we need to carry limpets, and therefore need to put a cargo rack in the remaining size 4 internal slot. The size 4 corrosion resistant cargo rack has the same capacity as the regular size 4, but has the advantage of allowing us to carry the hearts of our fallen enemies without suffering corrosion damage to our modules. If you do not have access to the corrosion resistant version, using a regular size 4 cargo rack is also perfectly fine. Finally, we need to fill the three military slots. Since we have no shield and our module protection is already accounted for, the best choice here is to go for additional hull and we install three size 4 hull reinforcement packs, engineered with heavy duty and a deep plating experimental for maximal hull points leaving our total hull at 3270 and finalizing the Meta Chieftain build. Having completed the build, we move on to discussing some of the optional choices to be made, starting with the utility slots, which were all equipped with heatsink launchers, there are two other options, the shutdown field neutralizer and the Xeno scanner. The shutdown field neutralizer gives you the capability of countering the interceptor's shutdown field ability. In a typical solo fight, triggering the shutdown field is completely avoidable, and even if you do, the consequences of triggering it are not major if handled correctly. It also occurs most once during a solo fight. Because of this, there is no real reason to include the neutralizer in the typical build but it is useful in scenarios such as high predictions or AX conflict zones where the interceptors jump into the instance and release the shutdown field on arrival. The Xeno scanner allows you easy access to information about the interceptor and the sword, such as remaining health, remaining hearts, shield status and remaining number of targons. It also allows you to sub-target the interceptor's hearts. However, with experience, all of these things may be inferred visually, reducing the need for a Xeno scanner. One notable situation where a scanner may be called for is your first encounters with a Hydra, since exerted Hydra hearts are notoriously difficult to spot without experience and sub-targeting the exerted heart can then be beneficial. However, 
in most situations, more heatsink launchers is the way to go, as it extends the number of sinks you can use before needing synthesis, and also allowing you longer attack runs if necessary. A common variation of the Meta Chieftain is the 64 limpet version, where instead of having a cargo capacity of 16, you install a size 6 cargo rack with a capacity of 64. This requires downgrading the size of your large MRP to 4, but offers more repair capacity. In a normal situation, you will not need more than 16 limpets, but it may be useful if you decide to take on multiple interceptors at the limit of your capability. Many recruits also wonder about if all of the engineering is absolutely necessary. While some of it is highly recommended, some can be skipped without too much issue, at least when fighting lower interceptor variants. Let's go through the engineering choices and see what is and isn't necessary to at least some extent and as a result obtain a minimally engineered ship, which I would not generally recommend, but which will serve you as an introductory ship for you to get a flavor of AX before you can get all the engineering done. Starting with the weapons, the only engineered weapon is the beam laser. The long range effect increases your range to 6 kilometers, which allows you to start beaming well before getting into the interceptor's firing range of 3 kilometers. However, as long as we can start beaming at a reasonable distance, we will do fine and reducing the grade of the engineering from 5 to 3 allows us to save a lot of engineering materials while still reaching a range of 4.8 kilometers. The thermal vent experimental effect is what allows us to dump heat and is absolutely crucial if you want to run a beam laser. The alternative is getting rid of the beam laser as it is not strictly necessary but a quality of life choice. If you do, you will not be able to use the laser to keep you cold on approach to orbit and will therefore use up more heat sinks. For the armor, going from grade 5 to grade 3 will reduce your hull by approximately 100 points and is therefore not horrible if engineering materials are scarce. When it comes to your power plant, you need to engineer it sufficiently to power your build, but a grade 3 will often suffice. However, this of course also makes the thermal efficiency somewhat worse. While your thrusters are the absolutely most important module to get fully engineered, you may go to grade 3 if you have not yet unlocked Professor Palin without suffering too much. Still, full grade 5 engineering on the thrusters is highly recommended. When it comes to your frame shift drive, it is not at all important for the fighting itself, and is more quality of life when moving back and forth between battles. For the purposes of the combat itself, you can skip the engineering completely. The same goes for the life support, which we had engineered for lightweight. The loss of speed and maneuverability is minimal when skipping the engineering. The power distributor, on the other hand, is your second most important module, as it will keep your Gauss cannons firing at as high of a rate as possible. However, if you are just starting out, your firing rate is probably far from optimal, meaning that you may get away with a lower level of engineering. Getting to grade 3 is however relatively cheap, so I do not recommend going below this. For the sensors, just as the frameshift drive and life support, the engineering is mainly quality of life, so it may be skipped entirely. When it comes to the heatsink launchers, having the additional sinks is a huge benefit but not strictly required. The material cost is however minimal, so if you have the possibility I strongly suggest that you do engineer them. Removing the engineering from the hull reinforcements sets your hull back significantly, losing almost a third of your hull points. The unengineered alternative is to instead use Guardian HRPs, which are better than unengineered human ones at the cost of some power draw, getting us back to almost 3000 hull points but putting us in a situation where we draw too much power. This may be mitigated by changing the experimental effect on the power plant to monster and turning off your cargo hatch and frameshift drive during fights. While this still leaves us with a too high power draw, we can reduce power draw further by either removing the beam laser, further reducing the need for engineering, or replacing the size 2 Guardian MRP with a regular one. As a final variation of the Meta Chieftain, we will discuss the flakless build. 
doing AX combat without a remote release flak launcher leaves you without options to destroy the Thargon Swarm. Instead, you then need to pay proper attention to where the Swarm is and how it is flying during the entire fight, including the attack runs, to ensure that it does not agitate by you flying through it. If it does agitate, you also need to be familiar enough with the Swarm mechanics to know what to do about it. Going without a flak launcher is therefore not recommended for beginners, but the build is quite popular among experienced AX pilots, so I did want to include it. The typical flak blitz build simply takes the standard meta chieftain and replaces the flak launcher by another thermal vent beam laser for additional damage done to the interceptor's shield. When you are at the level of being able to use a flakless build, your aim is also probably good enough to use fixed weapons, giving an additional boost to the damage output. That concludes our discussion of the Meta Chieftain and its variants used in AX combat. Good luck with your progression in fighting off the Targon threat. Glory to mankind.